Hello everyone, in today's video we will create an API backend using Node.js and Express. We'll work on 6 endpoints. We'll implement token-based authentication using JSON Web Tokens, for that we'll use Access and Refresh Tokens, and we'll go over how a client will use these. Our API will be backed by a MongoDB database, and we will use the Mongoose library to interact with it. Alright, let's get started. Let's go over how clients might use the Access and Refresh Tokens. We have our backend server, and a user might use multiple devices to access the server. For example, a mobile and a web app. When a client logs in, the client is issued an access and a refresh token. The access token has a short validity time. This token is used to access protected API endpoints. When this token expires, it can no longer be used to access the server. This is where the refresh token comes in. It has a much longer validity time, for example 30 days or even 90 days. When the access token expires, the refresh token is used to acquire a new access token. The client can then continue to access the protected endpoints using the new access token. We will also implement a logout all endpoint which will invalidate all previously issued refresh tokens for all devices so that they can no longer be used to acquire new access tokens. So let's get started on our project. We start by creating an empty folder for the project. In that folder execute npm init to initialize the npm project. Next execute git init to initialize git to allow us to commit our changes to source control. After that, we can open the project in a code editor. I'll be using WebStorm, but you can use whichever one you prefer. First, we install the .env package. This allows us to use environment variables throughout our project. We also save it as a dependency. Next, we install the nodemon package and we'll save it as a development dependency as we don't need it in production. This package will automatically reload the Node.js server when any files change. This saves us from restarting the server manually. Next, create the entry point index file in the root folder and an src folder. In the root index file, require the .env package. .env package needs to be executed before any other application code. Then we create an index.js file in the source folder and add an empty start server function and export it. In the root index file, we require the source module and execute it immediately. To run our Node.js server, we need to add a start script entry in the package.json file and use nodemon to execute our root index file. We'll also create a logger object that we'll use throughout the application to log messages. We'll use the pinup package for that, install it and save it as a dependency. In the source folder, create a logger folder and an index.js file. In this index file, create a pinup object specifying the log level which will be supplied through environment variables, and a timestamp format function and finally export the logger object. Now this logger can be used throughout the application. To supply environment variables, in the root of the project create a .env file and declare the environment variables and its values to be supplied to the application. Next we install the express package and save it as a dependency. In the source index file we use express to create an app and start the listener on the supplied port. Test it out, in a terminal execute the npm run start command and you will see a message log that the server is up and running. You may notice the log message is not very human friendly so let's fix that. We'll use the pinup pretty package to prettify the log messages. Install it and save it as a dependency. Next, we need to modify the start script in package.json file to use the pinup pretty package. Now, when we execute npm rom start, we can see better looking log messages. Next, we'll create the express roots. Inside the source folder, create a roots folder and the relevant index.js file. In the roots index file, we create a subpath and specify that the auth router will handle all paths with the auth prefix. We'll create the auth router shortly. In the source index file, we configure the app to use the router for all endpoints with the API prefix. Next, we'll create the authentication routes. In the routes folder, create an auth.js file. Here, I define the routes and an empty function handler which we'll replace with actual logic later. In the routes index file, declare the auth router variable. Then, we'll create the structure for the controllers which will hook up to the routes. In the source folder, create the controllers folder and the relevant index.js file and the auth.controller.js file which will contain the authentication handlers. In the auth.controller file, create an empty signup function. In the controllers index file, re-export the auth.controller. We're done with the controllers structure. We'll be interacting with the database, so let's get that set up next. We'll be using docker to run a mongodb container. Create a docker compose file in the root folder. Copy the contents you see on the screen. Here we are using the bitnami mongodb docker image, we expose the default port and configure the database to run in replica mode. This is to allow us to use database transactions. Run docker compose d and you should see a new docker container running. Next we install the mongoose package that we'll use to interact with the database. 
In the source folder, I create a database folder and the relevant index.js file. Here we create a function to connect to our database. Also ensure to add the necessary environment variables to the .env file. In the source index file, execute the connect to database function. Search our server and we should see that we've successfully connected to our MongoDB database. Next, we'll work on the database models. Create a models folder and the relevant index.js file and a user.model.js file. In the user model file, we create a user schema with two properties, a username and a password field. Both properties are string types. The username field must be unique and the password select false property means that when we fetch user records, we don't want the password field to be retrieved by default. In the models index file, we export the user model. Next, we'll add the refresh token model. We specify one field for the token owner and it references the user model. This will allow us to invalidate all refresh tokens for a given user. Next, we export the refresh token model in the models index file. Next, we install the argon2 package which we'll use for password hashing and the JSON web token for JSON web tokens. In auth.controller.js, we'll work on creating access and refresh tokens. In the access token, we are encoding the user ID and set an expiry time of 10 minutes and we use the access token secret to sign this JSON web token. Our refresh token is similar, except it includes the token ID in the payload and it has an expiry time of 30 days. We also use the refresh token secret to sign this JSON web token. Ensure to add the relevant environment variables to the .env file. Now it's time to work on the signup handler. We create a mongoose user document based on the supplied user details. We ensure to hash the user password so we don't store it in plain text. Create a refresh token document and set the owner to be the user doc ID. Save the user and the refresh token documents. Next, create the actual refresh and access tokens and return the response to the client. Ensure to require the argon2 and json web token packages. From the roots folder, open the auth.js file and update the handler used by the signup root. Start your server and test it using Postman. Send the username and password to our signup URL and you should get back a user ID an access token and a refresh token. To view the data in the database, I'll use MongoDB Compass. Specify the connection string and hit connect. Open up the DB1 database and you'll see two collections or tables. We have one user object and one refresh token object whose owner is this user. Next, we'll work on better error handling. Create a util folder and the relevant index.js file. Here, I create an error handler function which takes a function as an argument and we basically wrap the execution of the function in a try-catch block. We also get the return object of the function and send it back as a JSON to the client. If there are any errors thrown inside the function, we pass it to the express next function, which will use the express error handler to return an appropriate response to the client. Back in our auth controller file, change the signup function to be an async function and wrap it in our new error handler. And instead of using the express response object to send JSON back, we just return an object. Let's test if our new code works. In Postman, execute the signup request and we get a response back. Next, we'll define a custom express handler to use for handling errors passed to the express next function. In the source index file, define the custom error handler, which logs the stack trace and sends an error object back to the client. Next, we'll create a HTTP error class to enable us to throw errors inside of our controllers. Create an error folder and the relevant index.js file and a HTTP error.js file. The HTTP error class extends the basic error class and its constructor will accept a status code and a message. Next, we export the HTTP error class from the error index file. One last change to make in the source index file error handler is to use the error status code variable from the HTTP error class. So let's see how this works. In the signup function, throw a new HTTP error, passing in a status code and a message. Now when we execute the signup request, get back an error that we've thrown. Don't forget to remove the line that throws the error before moving on. Next, we'll set up database transactions. Transactions enable us to roll back database changes when an error occurs. This is useful when performing multiple database operations in one go. In our util index file, create a with transaction function. It takes a function as an argument, then we wrap the function inside the mongoose transaction helper. The mongoose transaction helper provides a session object which we pass to our function as an argument. So any database operation that uses this session object can be rolled back on errors. 
Next, update the signup function to use transactions. Simply wrap the function in a with transaction call and pass the transaction session object to the document save method call as an options object. To simulate transaction rollback, let's throw an error at some point after the save method call. In Postman, execute the signup request for a new user and we get an error back. Checking our MongoDB objects, we can see the new user with username on3 is missing, so the transaction rollback worked. Next, remove the forced error and execute the signup request again, and we get back an access token and refresh token. Checking MongoDB, we can see the new user object was persisted. Next, we'll work on the login controller. Wrap the function in an error handler and with transaction. First, we check if a user exists with a given username. We want to retrieve the password field as well, that's why the select plus password is specified. If no user is returned, we throw an error. Next, we verify the supplied password against the password hash stored in the database. Then we create a refresh token document and save it. Finally, create the actual tokens and return a response to the client. Next, hook up this controller to the login route. I actually made a mistake. We need to change user to user doc in the if check. Now in Postman, try to log in with a non-existent user and we get an error back. And if we log in with the user that exists and we supply the right password, we get the tokens back. Next, we'll create the new refresh token controller. Again, we use transaction and our error handler. We validate the refresh token supplied in the request body. If validation fails, a 401 unauthorized error will be thrown. If validation passes, the token is decoded and returned. Then we create a new refresh token document, save the document, read the tokens and return them. Export the function and hook it up to the refresh token route. Tested in Postman, first get a refresh token by signing up or logging in, then execute the new refresh token request. I have a typo in the code. After fixing that, execute the request and we get back a new refresh token and access token. Next, I delete all the refresh tokens in the database, check the new objects persisted. And I realize each time a new refresh token is requested, the previous token remains in the database. We don't want that. We want to invalidate or delete the previous refresh token so it can no longer be used. In the new refresh token controller, delete the supply token from the database. And update the validate refresh token function to also check the refresh token ID exists in the database. To test it out, I remove all refresh tokens from the database, and this time when a new refresh token is requested, the previous one is removed. Now we'll create the new access token controller. Here we just use the error handler as we won't be updating the database. We verify the supplied refresh token. If validation passes, we generate a new access token and return to the client. We cut up to the access token route and in Postman, use a refresh token to execute the new access token request. And we get back the same refresh token, but a new access token. For the logout controller, we are simply going to delete the supplied refresh token from the database so that validation will fail if these tokens are used to get new access tokens. Hook up the controller to the logout route. In Postman, get a refresh token and execute the logout request. and we get back a success response. For the logout all controller, we will simply remove all refresh tokens associated with the current user, so the user will need to log in again on all devices. This is useful in case of access compromise or password changes. Add a logout all route and hook up the controller. Execute the request and we see that all refresh tokens were removed for that user. Next, we'll create a protected route and see how the access token can be used to protect endpoints. In the roots folder, create a users.js file. Add a slash me root. In the roots index file, define the users path and specify the users router for that path. In the controllers folder, create a users.controller.js file 
and define an empty function. We export it in the controller's index file and hook up the me controller to the me root. For the me controller, we simply query the database for the user object with an ID, which we'll get from the supplied access token. To protect our endpoints, we'll use a middleware. The middleware can be specified for individual endpoints and it runs before the controller logic. It will parse and validate the access token. If validation passes, the controller logic will be executed. And if validation fails, an error will be returned. Create a middlewares folder and an index.js file. Create a verify access token function which takes three arguments, request, response, and next. Then we extract the access token from the authorization header. If a token is not supplied, we throw an error. Otherwise, we verify and decode the token. Set the user ID property on the request object and call the next function to continue executing the chain of request handlers. If token verification fails, we catch it and throw an unauthorized error. Our error handler function can only be used in controllers, so let's update it to allow usage of the next function used by middlewares. In the me controller, set the ID to search for from the request user ID property and set the verify access token middleware on the me root. In the verify access token middleware, fix the required statements. And finally, change the me root to be a get request instead of a post request. So for any endpoint that we want to protect with an access token, we specify the verify access token middleware. In Postman, create the get request for the me endpoint and in the authorization tab, choose the type to be a bearer token and add a valid access token for the token field. Execute the request and we get the user details back. Congratulations on reaching this point. We've created a backend with authentication and authorization, and this can be a starting point for many applications. Finally, let's commit our code changes to source control. Create a .git ignore file and add entries to ignore the node modules folder, .env file, and the .idea folder if you use WebStorm. To commit our changes, execute git add dot to stage the files, and then run git commit and specify a commit message. And we're done. Thanks for following along, and see you in the next one.